What's up? It's the People Shark here, Damon John, and welcome to my interview series called Advertising and Innovation. Here's where I sit with some of the most strategic, forward-thinking creatives in the advertising industry. These people are absolutely amazing. I have so much to learn from them. And this is brought to you by the London International Awards as well as the Shark Group, my group, Damon John's group. And I cannot wait to get into this first one. The first one I'm gonna be sitting with today is Judy John. No relationship, we are not cousins or we are not family, but we will be after this. I'm sure there's a lot to learn. She is the Global Chief Creative Officer at Edelman, and we are gonna be talking about the intersection of brands and culture, how the power of earned media and authenticity, and how to be a strong creative, way much more things out there, how to find your space in the creative world, where she found her space, and what does she see moving forward, and we are gonna have a great time. I can't wait. Well, there you are. Thank you so much, Judy, for being here with me and with the audience. Um, for the viewers who may not uh, be familiar with you or your work, can you just give me a little background on you know, who you are, where you came from, and how did you make it into the advertising agency world? Yeah, sure. Um, so I am at Edelman. It's a communications company and PR agency. I've been here for a couple of years. I'm, a, I'm the global chief creative officer before that, I worked in advertising agencies from independents to multinationals. And then before that, I came from a small town in Canada and worked at my parents' restaurant. That's that's kind of a, a bridge version. No, no, and listen, if anybody, if, if people don't know Edelman, they probably shouldn't be watching this. So, you know, so um, that's a big job you have, and uh, you're doing amazing work over there. What, but going from the parents' restaurant, what was the moment that you realized? wow, th this is where I want to be. This is where I want to make a difference. Well, I, I think it started early on. Um, you know, I watched a lot of television growing up. Um, and then in high school, I was, I was the uh, publicity director. So, you know, we made posters for the dances and, and things like that. But really, it was the motivation to get out of the small town I was living in, or my parents were going to marry me off at a very young age. So it was really motivating for me to uh, find a path outside of the restaurant business and, and advertising was it. And, you know, I, I've seen that you started off in restaurants as well, and I'm sure it was a similar motivation to find your path. Yeah, you know, it was kind of that there's, I mean, listen, I, you know, of course, going in the restaurant business, you could maybe go into management, but I just had bigger dreams and I just felt, uh, I just felt so in love with this emerging music of hip hop and fashion at the same time. So I think that it was just me following something that I really loved and realized, wait a minute, I can actually make a living doing something I'm actually happy about. Yeah. You know, I can resonate with that. Exactly. But, um, you know, where we are today, you know, we know that culture drives brand trust and you, you have overseen so many great brands. And as I mentioned in the intro earlier, what do you look for in the brands that you do work for? Well, you know, it's it's interesting how culture has become more important and, and we're really finding that we do this, um, you know, Edelman does a, a brand trust uh, survey and we've been doing a, this, this brand trust for 20 years now. And what we're discovering is that, you know, people are expecting brands to not only reflect culture, but to change and lead culture. Like that's that's what we're finding now. And, you know, if you're a functional product, you know, it's it counts for about 27 points on the, you know, likability and, and trust. And when you are reflecting culture, that gives you a 25% bump to a 52. And when you're changing culture, you know, you get a 38 point jump to 65 um, in terms of, you know, advocacy for your brand and trust. So it's, you know, when we're working with brands and companies, we're looking at, you know, not just what they're selling, but what impact can they have in culture in the world? And, 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 you know, I've been doing my research on you and, you know, you've been a believer of this like way back from when you first began, you know, FUBU you know, the reflecting culture and the creating culture with your with your T-shirts and the slogans on the T-shirts, like you've known that for quite some time. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, well, 
And thank you for that. I know that, you know, when you create something, I believe that you have a small community that believes in you and you then grow that community. But it's easy for me to say, I'm mad at the system because the people that we're buying the clothes from don't respect or value us. And then that's, that's, that's really easy to say, right? But when you are working with massive brands, and, and we've seen clearly over this last you know two years with the social issues that we are so divided as people when we have more in common than we have apart. But when you say you're a big sneaker company, you say, I'm gonna support somebody kneeling even though you are saying that they're changing culture, how many people are they are going, wait a minute, I, I don't want to be part of that culture anymore. You're changing it in the wrong way. And, and, and of course, that's, that's the fine line we, we walk on when, when somebody like you who's looking over massively large brands uh, have to deal with. Yeah, it's true. It, and, you know, Nike's a great example of that because their share actually went up when they started to support Kaepernick. And, you know, a lot of people went online and they started burning their jerseys. But it was, you know, when you think think about their purpose and what they believe in, they continued in that belief and people followed them. And, it, you know, we're, we, we've just discovered that consumers really have a say in brands now. You know, they're not just passive and they can force, they feel and they believe they can force brands to change just about anything, you know, from the, you know, what they do environmentally to social impact because they can buy or not buy. And, and that's really important to companies in their yeah, success. Absolutely. Because, you know, we've seen it, whether it be, what does a true woman look like with Victoria's Secret? And all of a sudden, you know, they, they had to get behind it or you're saying you're not going to take the name off the stadium. No problem. I just won't support this company. And exactly. all of a sudden, magically, it was a misunderstanding. All right. So right. I think consumers actually have the power. And I think that we, you know, that leads me to one of my next questions is really about earned media. There's a lot of noise out there and big brands need to make sure that they get in front of people's faces. And of course, you have to pay for a lot of stuff. But how can a big brand really um, break down and, and, and get earn media and come from an authentic place. Yeah, it's, you know, we, we're we all about earned media and, and we talk about it and the importance of, you know, you can't buy trust, you have to earn it. And that's just, you know, it's just the way humans are. And we talk about earning um, that trust, whether you're buying media, whether it's your own channels or it's earned, you have to create that value exchange. You know, how do you earn attention? How do you create that relationship and conversations? So it is getting into that mindset of culture and what people care about right now and what they want to, the values that they, they believe in and, and reflecting those. And, and that, you know, that's the intersection, we believe. Do you think now that everybody's hypersensitive, do you think, though, if a brand stayed quiet during something and they weren't directly involved in any of the matter, but it's a hot topic of today, right? Because, yeah. you know, as, as a brand's out there, you know, people think, you know, listen, private companies and public companies, but private companies mainly, you know, the brand started off wanting to do something. They wanted to solve a problem. They figured out, they figured that, uh, you know, somebody else was going to solve this problem and nobody did. So they started themselves and they were really passionately driven. But today we get, we're, we're so in tune with so many things. So if it's not, what are you doing about Me Too movement? What are you doing about LGBT right. plus? What are you doing about uh, uh, Black Lives Matter? Oh, today it's Cuba. At what point does a brand go, I get it, but I, I, I'm not into all though. Do you, or do you, or do they say, but here's what I do care about. I care about clean water around the planet. I care about reducing plastics. I care about stopping human trafficking. And yes, those matter. All those matter. But I can't be everyone to everybody. I'm not the government. That's exactly right. And we've talked to so many clients about that. And it is about authenticity, right? You can't talk about something your company doesn't believe in or in an area that you haven't been involved in. It's just, it's not authentic but it's also also really risky to go wade into those areas. So there isn't an expectation to be in the things that you don't you aren't associated with. But 
you know, a lot of brands might think the safest thing to do is just like sit back and ride it out, just not get involved. But what we're seeing is that, you know, the brands that are in the companies that are stepping in where they should be, consumers and people are thinking you need to step up, you need to come in where governments and um, aren't stepping up. And there is that expectation right now. And, and those companies are being rewarded with loyalty and with, you know, sales and, and goodwill. Yeah, and I get that. But then there's that, that one in the middle where you, you are purpose driven over here, but everybody is moving towards this goalpost and, and they're saying, why aren't you part of it at all? Meaning the, I'm not sure what team it was or what, what league it was, but the NBA is not going to air tonight due to, uh, or play tonight due to whatever the purpose is. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, then neither is the NFL, neither is the NHL because they have to follow suit. Because if you don't, then you're looking like you're actually against whatever potential great cause people or, or attention they're trying to bring. I, 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 I don't even have an answer for that. I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah, it's it's really situation by situation. It's not, you know, it's so, and you know this, the environment is so delicate right now because there is so much division. And because of social, people can comment on everything and anything, and they do. You know, our, our entire, you know, corporate practice and crisis pack, practice really spent a lot of time with clients talking about what are, you know, what is the upside and the downside of getting involved in any given conversation at any time? And, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot at stake to get it right. So there is no, there's no magic answer. Right. So let's talk about something that's, uh, that's, that's great, some stuff that you're doing, you know, so diversity and opportunity. I, I, I love this. I understand you're involved in uh, Gold House, which is a collective of uh, Asian founders, uh, creative voices, and leaders dedicated to unifying the world's largest population, uh, Asians. Um, I remember taking my uh, 21 and Me test, and uh, um, I, I'm I'm 60% Asian because of my one, my father from Trinidad, which came from India, uh, so India East Indian. Um, so let's talk about that, and um and and Pacific Islanders to enable more. Uh, I think there's another one, a more multicultural representation, and societal equity. Uh, why do you get involved with these organizations? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a really good question. I, I grew up and it's counterintuitive because I grew up in a small town and we were one of two Asian families. And so there was a big spotlight on me the whole time. And I really just tried to blend in as much as I could um, until I moved to Toronto and gone into um, advertising and it's, you know, it's much more diverse in, in the bigger cities, but they reached out a couple of years ago. Um, and I was, I was nominated for their a 100 most influential Asians in the U S. And so, you know, being part of this community, I learned about what they're doing. You know, it's, it's all the leaders in arts, media, sports, technology, fashion, and business. And I met some really incredible leaders. And I realized I haven't been using my voice, you know, like we all have a voice. And I, you know, I was brought up to keep my head down. Don't get in trouble. Don't put your head up. You're just gonna, you know, get yourself in hot water. And um, it's Gold House has really opened my eyes to being an advocate and an ally and using my voice and our voice to help the API community and businesses thrive. And it, you know, I always felt like that's not my responsibility, but it is, you know, I, I feel like it is part of what I should be doing as a leader. I think it's on all of us. And, you know, I, I was reading about you doing um, something with Lowe's called making it. And I thought that's, you know, that's your platform. And I, I, you know, I think you do a lot of different things, but you know, you're, you're, you're giving back as well. No, I agree with you. I think that as, uh, as we were going through the George Floyd stuff last year, I was calling all my corporate friends and partners and, you know, they were calling me asking me, you know, some, some sensitive, 
issues on what to deal with. A lot of them were like, we thought we were doing enough and we're not. Yeah. Um, and then I said to myself, let me, I, I threw something called Black Entrepreneur's Day and I started doing stuff with Lowe's because I kept saying, well, somebody else, maybe our government, maybe somebody's going to help us. But you know what? All of us have to help because if we keep thinking somebody else is going to do it, it's never getting, it's never, never going to get done. Yeah. It's it's so true. And I, I think that we're reaching that tipping point now where we feel like it, it we can't wait for someone else or the government or, you know, other organizations to do it. We have to do something because we can. Yeah. And and I know we talked a little bit because I want I want now to go to some of the creatives who want to one day become a Judy, work for a Judy, maybe or have been inspired by a Judy. You know, as we talked about the companies, uh, you know, being on brand or having these, um, you know, things that they believe in, what do the creatives do who want to create things that for brands, but they just don't want to be either called tone deaf or culture vultures or what are they? Because, you know, now it's almost like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a creative. I love this world, this culture. I love this brand. I want to be authentic, but I happen not to be of color or I happen not to be yeah. a woman. And now all of a sudden, like, I, I'm scared. Yes. And there's been so much uh, talk about you can't say that because you're not from that culture. And I think that we're almost, you know, at times we're, we're, we're indexing. We're, look, all movements that happen take a point where it goes, you know, uh, to a greater extreme and then ends up being more moderate. And that's how movements have really taken shape over time. And I think that to be a creative right now and, and anybody in the business right now, I say we need diversity and, and it's not just a word, but it's diversity of ability, but of thinking, you know, and of people, because you share an idea and someone will say, you know, and give you the nuance of what that means to them or to a group that you don't have that viewpoint. And it actually, it often makes the idea better. You know, it makes mm -hmm. it stronger. We think by sharing ideas and getting input, it makes the idea worse, but it's, it actually makes the ideas stronger and has a, has a greater right of being out in the world because it's reflecting different points of view. That's uh, truly innovation. I mean, you know, yeah. you get another way of thinking that you may not have thought about it. I think a peanut butter sandwich is great. You think a jelly sandwich is great. We put it together. It's, uh, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. Yes, exactly. But do we have to also say to the creatives, and, and I always say this to anybody that I work with, I, I find that my most, um, the people that I've seen move up the ladder most in my company and in the world, they don't just take orders. You know, they yeah. come in and they say, do you mind any uh, any further suggestions? Is there any way I can help you? Is there something that I haven't presented? What is what is a challenge for you? And then they go back and bake as much as they can because the person on the other side, whether it's Damon, whether it's Judy, s says this person cares about it and they didn't just go, well, here's an idea. You know, because I, I love the way that my, my mentor always says to me, there's two type of there's two type of people in the world. There's a uh, there's a customer and a client. A customer comes into a hardware store and says, I got a nail sticking out of my uh, thing over here. I need a hammer. Okay, here's a hammer. A client comes in and goes, I got a nail sticking out over there, but I'm not sure how many more nails is there. I'm not sure if I need a hammer or this and that. But maybe, I, well, you might sell them a toolbox after that because they need various different things in various different areas of that floor, right? Um, so how do creatives or how does anybody prepare themselves well enough to present new ideas to to judy or to the staff or to people what, what would be some tips well i i you know the first thing i always i always do myself with clients or when i'm reviewing work is i question the question so you know your example is great of a client might say i need a hammer and then you go do you need a hammer or is that all you need and I think yeah. that sometimes we don't ask those deeper questions. And what are you really trying to build? And what is the short term thing that you want to do? And what is the longer th thing that you're trying to accomplish? Because sometimes we're so focused on this, but we really need to solve something more systemic or something bigger. And, and they don't know what they don't know. Yeah, exactly. And creativity is solving 
business problems and, and, and larger problems. So I think sometimes we can get too micro-focused. So the first thing I would say to creatives is question the question and always have a bigger ambition on what you should be solving, not what you could, you know, don't just take the order. That's like, that's the first thing. And then the other thing is when I'm reviewing creative and when I ask clients and internally, when we review ideas is don't criticize. Like it's easy to sit back and go, well, that's terrible. That's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. seen. It's, it's create, like we need to create to, together. How do we make it better? So I'm not afraid to share an idea with you, Damon, because I know you're going to make it better. And that spirit of building yeah. is what makes things better. But if I'm worried that you're going to hate on my ideas, then I'm going to censor some of my ideas. Some of the best ones not might not rise to the top. So it's also creating that environment where creativity can live and thrive. I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, listen, if you are a creative or if you're anybody that has value, if somebody doesn't see it and, uh, you know, I, I go back, or if, if somebody doesn't see what, I see and I say, what did I do wrong? Did I present it the right way? Did I have enough research? Uh, did I ask the right questions? Yeah. And if I did all that and that person is constantly negative, then I'm going to still try to present to the person, but I'm gonna to try to find other people to present it to. And then, you know what, if uh, worst scenario, you know, I will at least know that this is not a place that I wanna be at for a long period of time. I'm gonna work on how can I be the best there so that I can really add value wherever I end up if, in, in case, you know, I keep getting stagnant, especially as a, as a creative. But I would love to know now, you know, when you and I both probably started out in business, it was a whole different world. Um, if you were a creative today, what would you be excited about in today's technology world, you know, post, well, I know we're not done with COVID, but post COVID, what would you be excited about if you were that, and I know you're only 25, but if you were that 18 year old, 19 year old. Yeah, I, you know, I tell people it's crazy right now. But I tell people, this is the best time to be in the business. Like the amount of innovation that's happened in because of the, of the digital world is just accelerating. And that is maddening because you, you have to stay on top of all the innovation that, that happened every day and all the platforms that emerge. But it's also from a creative perspective, you've ha you have more canvases than you ever have. The fact that you can be an influencer on TikTok and start a business, we never had that opportunity 20 right. years ago. Like there is so much room for creativity and content. Like content is the battleground right now. Like of how the, we all have choices of what we watch, when we watch, I'm gonna pause it, I'm not gonna, you know, whatever, skip it. So the content needs to be that much more relevant and interesting. And that's why the culture piece is so important right now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, this drastic change, some of the old guard will be forced to adjust and some will just go away. And you know, listen, I, I go to play a sport against somebody. I'm not mad, you know, uh, if they're trying to win, man, because yeah. I need to improve my game. And if you are out there and you're creative and you know, you feel that you are adding value and coming up with amazing things, then you, you're forced to step up. Um, but I think also the assets available to us, like you said, are, are way better now. I mean, you know, the, the the best thing that probably came out of this COVID situation is the universe is on your side. Everybody you call a contact today, they had anxiety, they may have had various different laws, they had, and you know what, they're all looking to for other people to collaborate with. Yeah. You know, maybe you called them two years ago and they were like, I'm busy, I'm on a plane, train, automobile, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. No, they are all looking and you, they're not laughing at you because they're like, you know, because me, you know, I'm down from seven anxiety attacks to two. I only have one at 6.59 in the morning and 3.35 in the afternoon. I'm doing quite well. And you can also work with people around the world that maybe you worked with five years ago where you were in LA and now they're in New York and now you can work together again, or maybe there's still some place, but they've gained another four hours or three hours a day round trip where they have time oh, to do stuff. So absolutely. it's just such an amazing time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I when I was reading about FUBU coming back, I was wondering what, you know, and, and in the influencers you used back then, like LL Cool J, like who, how would you do it now? You were so 
when we when I think about earned and how you made that brand famous, who are those people now? You know, that's an excellent question. And I always went to the influencers who were influencing the influencers, the small uh, person in the neighborhood that maybe the world didn't know. But when LL Cool J came to the neighborhood, he knew that person. And I think, you know, we've been pondering around that FUBU has been has grown to be much bigger than 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 its name and that it has mm -hmm. another responsibility. And I figured that um, what we probably would do now is get two representative, a young man, a young woman in each high school and each college. Um, they are authorized FUBU dealers. We credit them with five hundred dollars worth of FUBU a week or a month and they sell it and it's worth twelve hundred dollars worth of FUBU. Um, and, you know, there's kind of like this level of the more they sell, the more curriculums we give them or to help them further with financial intelligence and opening up, you know, their own businesses. And they really become ambassadors who are empowering themselves and empowering the community. And I think that, again, you know, not the, the whole story of don't give them a fish. If you teach them how to fish, they become your ambassador for life. And, and I think that that's probably something that we're, we're going to roll out. Yeah, that's a very cool idea. I like that. Yeah. Now, now let's hope it works. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you listen, the Avon model is funny, right? They, in, in Avon, um, I believe, you know, I don't know what the numbers are. When I recently looked, what, eight, 18 billion or 19 billion, but I'm not, and I, I, I never like to say brands to somebody like you because you may go, oh yeah, I represent them. <laughs> but um, uh, I remember the model being something like the average Avon salesperson sold about $5,000 worth of Avon a, uh, a year because they were just buying it for themselves. Right. You know, at the end of the day. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to, to think about, you know, where we are today and how we can do uh, do it a little different and get earned media. Because I won't have to I won't have to t put out FUBU in this way. I'll have kids going, you see why I bought this? Because I did this. And this is the right. company. Da, 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 da. So. Right. Exactly. That's earned. Well, it's really good talking to you. I mean, I would love to pick your brain further. I know you have a, a, a limited time. Uh, is there any questions you have for me? Well, you know, I, I was um, reading about uh, I was reading about Shark Tank, and you know that I was watching some of the greatest uh, the greatest clips, the greatest cells, and I wondered, you know, that is creativity, right? And, and it's something that we do every day. We go into a room, we present the client, we try to sell them an idea. So when you're in that room, what is it? Like, what are you buying? Are you buying the person? Are you buying the show? Are you buying the idea? How do you weigh that? It's one of the toughest decisions because there's the monetary side and the reward. So you'll have people come in, their pitch is down pat, they are doing X amount of dollars. They know who their client is. They know their customer will buy it at 99, but not at 129. They live in Detroit. They love, they like dogs, whatever the case is, but I don't like the person. And I just find that I don't want to deal with people that I don't like, um, whether it be the pe person I hire, you know, if you come to my office, you know, and um, once you get past that application, it's, can I sit next to you for eight hours a day, five days a week for the next five years of my life? Um, because I, I've been blessed enough to not have to deal with people to make money from because Steve Jobs is never going to call me. Well, he's dead. He's never going to call me to help fix a computer and neither is Jeff Bezos or anybody else. Right. Um, and I can put money in the market. So I guess to, to make a long story short, it is the person. Right. You know, when somebody tells me a pitch, when somebody sells me a pitch, I like to t say it. It's like a, it's like an infomercial. Has this ever happened to you? And you said there's got to be a better way. Now I'm resonating with it. Yes, it happened to me. There's got to be a better way. Well, my name is Damon John, and I went through all these things in my life, and I'm still here because I found a better way, and I'm going to share this better way with you. And if you buy this better way by midnight tonight, I'm going to send you two better ways. And if you don't like it, I'll take it back. You know, that, that's, the, that's the type of pitch I like to make sure you are into it. For me, I resonated with it. Now I want to know your story. How did you overcome everything or how much homework did you do on it? Right. Why is the buy-in very easy for me? And what if I don't like it? What are we going to do? And I think that, uh, you know, it works most of the time unless I'm pitching my wife because uh, then I got to give her 10 of the better ways for free. But um, that's how I find the pitches that I really love. And then, then there is, honestly, there is some charitable ones where... It's not the money's charity. I think the mentorship is something they really need and they just need right. somebody to give them a helping hand and get them over that hump or at least let them know that 
I tried with them. We left everything on the field. Let's start over again a little more wisely, but let's start over together because we like each other. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that's a great, I, and I'm the same way about life's too short to work with, you know, people you don't enjoy working with anymore. That's like, that's when you're young. That's like when you don't have a choice, but when you have choices, it is um, that team building and, and enjoying what you do and, and having a shared goal, it just makes it that much better and easier. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking. I know you're extremely busy. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with the brands, but more importantly, uh, the creatives here that are looking up to you and, and they may be frustrated or they may be super excited or, you know, they're, they're trying to figure their way out and yeah. they, they, they get to see somebody as brilliant as you share, share some of this knowledge that has gotten to you to where you are as you, uh, you know, as we see your work every single day. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your time. And uh, one day we'll talk about Sharknado too. I'm so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you saw that. I saw that. Yeah. <laughs> not my, not my proudest moment. But... I, I loved it. <laughs> the penis is so good. I love it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What's up? Now it's the Sharp Damon John here, and if you're already here. I already know you're dedicated to bettering yourself and learning as much as you can. To learn even more, subscribe to my channel and make sure that you don't miss any of these valuable videos. And I will see you next time.